Last time we were looking at section 3.4 um, and we were graphing polynomial functions. We had these basic five keys to graphing and we talked about how the first three were very useful to us. Um, the fourth one was a sort of it may need to be happening. In particular, we tried to graph maybe that the y-intercept is a useful point and potentially some others. Um, and in work, when we're connecting the dots, we connect them in a smooth way, not like connect the dots on a, you know, a game board kind of thing. It's not like that. So as we're taking a look at these, we had done one example. It was this one. Um, and we did exactly what I just described. We found the symmetry. We found the x-intercepts. We talked about the end behavior. We did the y-intercept, and we sketched a graph. So we're going to pick up there with the next example. Um, and it's g of x equals negative x to the fourth plus x squared plus 12. And we're going to go through the same steps that we looked at last time. So what was the first step when we were when we organized, right, organized that and write them down? It's about symmetry, okay? Nothing special about doing it in that order, but we're just going to stick with the same order each time. So symmetry was the first thing we had talked about. So when we're looking at symmetry, what are we testing? Right, we're testing the function at negative x. And our function here is called g, so I'll use g. But we're going to plug in negative x for all the x's. So it looks like that. All right, so there's a couple pieces of information. Um, that are in parentheses, namely the negative x to the fourth and the negative x squared. So what happens when I do negative x to the fourth? It becomes positive, and there happens to be a negative in front of it, so the whole thing then for that piece will still be negative, right? So the first part of our expression um, on the right-hand side is negative x to the fourth. How about the second piece? How about that negative x that's now squared? It's also positive, and it's got a positive in front of it on that one, so that one will also be positive x squared. And the 12 just stays 12. There's no variable component to that. So comparing this back to the original g of x function, what do you notice? It's the same. This is exactly the same as what the function started as. So what does that tell you about the symmetry? It's even. Do you remember that? About the y-axis, that's exactly the next question. Good. So this is even. Likewise, we can talk about it having y-axis symmetry. All right. What was the second piece of information that we had found when we were looking at the last example? Yeah, x-intercepts. And x-intercepts are the places where y equals 0. In particular, it means we have 0 equals negative x to the fourth plus x squared plus 12, right? How do we find x-intercepts when we have a function like this? What are some things we might try? Factoring. And if it works, that's fantastic. Um, so let's start there. Okay, factoring is a good place to start. Now, it's not especially friendly that there's a negative in front of the x to the fourth term. Agreed? So we can actually get rid of that by just simply multiplying or dividing, however your perspective is, everything by negative 1. And that doesn't change the left-hand side, which is a 0, because that's just 0. Um, but basically, we're going to either multiply or divide, however you want to write it down, by negative 1. <coughs> just because it's more convenient, really. This is x to the fourth, then minus x squared and minus 12. All right, so with the positive coefficient in front of the x to the fourth term now, it's a little bit easier to factor. How will this factor? It's not exactly a quadratic, but it's quadratic-like. I'll start the first parts out. How about this as a star spot? That'll give me x to the fourth, right? What else do I need? OK, so a minus 4, which would then make this a plus 3. Um, there's a couple things to double check, right, to make sure that when I multiply the back two values, the negative 4 and the positive 3, do I get to negative 12? Yep, so that's good. 
The next thing to check is to make sure that the inside and the outside terms add to negative x squared in the middle. Do they? Yeah, so this is the right factoring. Is there any of it that can be factored any further? <laughs> right, so the x squared minus 4 can be factored further. How can it be factored? X plus 2 Good. Um, and then x squared plus 3 doesn't factor any further over the real numbers, right? It doesn't because of the plus. If it were a negative, it would. It wouldn't be particularly pretty numbers, but it would work. All right, so this is as factored as we can get. And we want to make each piece now equal to 0. So if I let that happen, what's the first x value? Negative 2. With the multiplicity of what? 1, right? Multiplicity is like the exponent on the term. There is an exponent of 1 on this term. What about the second one? 2. Mm -hmm. And it has a multiplicity of 1. And then what happens over here at this one? Oh, I hear whispering. <laughs> What happens if I do this? It becomes a what? Yeah, it becomes imaginary. Um, I get x squared on the left. I get negative 3 on the right. If I try to take square roots of this, I get imaginary values. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with imaginary values, um, except that, well, we're working on graphs with the real number system. So this is not going to give us any information about the graph. Okay? So this is... not, we'll say not on the graph. I was about to make a stronger statement that's not quite true, so not on this graph anyway. So it's irrelevant to the conversation we're currently having. That's the deal. Why does the multiplicity matter? What does it tell us about these particular points? Not how many times, but whether it touches or crosses, right? Yeah, so the exponent, or the multiplicity, will tell us whether the graph cuts through the x-axis or whether it bounces off the x-axis. Both of these have multiplicities of 1. So what information does that give us? They'll go through the x-axis, exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and plot those on my graph. And we have one more piece of information to find. We know it's going to cut through at both those points. The last piece of information, actually there's two more pieces of information, but the third piece of information is about end behavior. So tell me what we remember about end behavior from last time. How do we make the decision? The degree and the leading coefficient, very good. So what's the degree of the whole polynomial originally as it was given? Four, it's an even degree. So when the graph has an even degree, it means that either both ends on the ends of the graph point up. Think about the just standard parabola graph, like y equal x squared, right? Or they both point down. It's one or the other. And then the leading coefficient tells us which one. This leading coefficient's negative, so how will the ends of our graph point? Down. So we have both going down. And that actually tells us how to graph over here. It tells us these pieces both have to go down. Now, obviously, and, and we also have the symmetry thing, right? So this kind of makes sense. I've got a 2 and a negative 2 on the right and the left. There's some symmetry involved on that. Um, and we expect to hit the y-axis and bounce up and bounce right back down, right? Like that's going to be the peak or the vertex of what we're got, we have going on. So let's find our y-intercept. Um, y-intercept is pretty easy to find. The y-intercept is when x equals 0. So if I plugged in 0 into that function, what am I going to get? Yeah, I'm going to get the 12, right? All the other pieces are going to disappear because they're zeros, and I'm going to add a 12. So my y-intercept is at x equals 0 and y equals 12. So that's about 12. That was terrible. Let me try that again. All right, 
So that doesn't look quite right. That's more believable. What's it really look like on this particular one? What's it called? Parabola. Looks like a parabola, right? Um, they don't always have that feature. Um, this could have had some more bouncing around and things. It just didn't. Uh, but it looks roughly like a parabola on this particular graph. All right, let's try another one. This one starts out a little differently. What's different about it? It's factor. There are both good things and bad things about that. So if we start the same place we've started the previous two examples, what will we be finding first? Symmetry. All right, this is our function, it's called h. So we're plugging in negative x's. It looks like that. The symmetry on this one, and I alluded to this last time in class, this is the one, um, it's not easy to find. Uh, because of the factored form, it makes it a lot more difficult, right? Like we changed the x's to negatives, but we didn't change the constants. But the x and the constant are combined with addition or subtraction, and then they're squared or cubed. Well, that's different, right? Like if I had x minus 6 and I had x plus 6 and they were each squared, they wouldn't be the same thing when they were done. And they also wouldn't be exactly opposites of each other when they were done. And not only that, but we don't just have x minus 6 and x plus 6. Um, I'm sorry, x minus 6 squared or x plus 6 squared that we're comparing, we also have that times this, this piece with this 7 in it, right? This is not an easy task to do on this one unless you just multiply it all out, and I will contend that that's not easy either. I don't want to multiply this out. Do you? No. It's cubed and it's squared, and then you have to multiply the cubic term with the squared term when you're all said and done, and then you've got the x at the beginning. Okay, so for right now, just leave a little bit of space by this one, either underneath it or to the side of it. We're going to come back and we're going to answer the question, is it even, odd, or neither, but we're not going to do this algebraically, okay? There are things that are just absolutely not worth our time to do with an algebraic sense, and this is one of them. So let's go on to the second piece of information. There's really nothing special about me giving you a one, two, three list of items to do. We're just going to bypass one. We'll come back to it, okay? So let's look at number two. The second one is x-intercepts. Now, with x-intercepts, the way that this problem is given to us is very friendly, right? On the last two problems, when I had to do x-intercepts, what was I doing? It's factoring. And this one is, well, it's already factored. So for the x-intercept part of this one, it's very friendly as it's given to us. So I need to have each piece of this set equal to zero, right, and solved. So if we set each piece equal to zero, what's my first x-intercept? Zero. And what's the multiplicity of that one? One. That one's kind of like the last one. What's my second x-intercept? Negative six. And what's its multiplicity? Two. Two. Uh, and the third x-intercept is what? Seven. And its multiplicity is three. Okay, everybody good so far? I'm going to go ahead and put those on the graph uh, because it'll be helpful for us to actually be able to see some pieces of this put together. Okay, so this is x equals seven. This is x equals zero in the middle. And this is x equals negative 6 on the left. I actually contend that right now you could go back and you could answer the symmetry question. So let me show you how I know that. The x-intercept at the origin is no big deal. But we have an x-intercept on the right-hand side at 7 and on the left-hand side at 6. Right? 6 away. So is that 
y-axis symmetry if I've intercepted at 7 on the left and 6 on the right, or vice versa, actually? No, this is not y-axis symmetry. There's no way, because the intercepts are different distances away from the y-axis, okay? I should be able to rotate it around. Not only that, but it's also not origin symmetry, because if you put sort of, the, you know, like a, a brad in the middle of the board, and you rotated it 180 degrees, the same thing would have to happen. This point that's at 7 on the right would have to rotate around here and be a negative 7 on the left, and it isn't, correct? So it doesn't have origin symmetry either. So this graph is neither. So we can go back and we can answer that question now using the x-intercepts as a reference point. Um, we can also talk about whether the graph cuts through or bounces off, but we'll do that in just a second when we sort of start piecing the pieces, to, I mean, putting the pieces together with connecting the dots. Let's do the um, end behavior first. So if we do the end behavior here, it's a little bit trickier than the last one as well because it's not all multiplied out. And we've already established the fact that none of us want to multiply this thing out, okay? But all of the information about end behavior is determined by the degree that's the highest degree. Agreed? Its degree and the coefficient in front of it. So where would that come from if I were multiplying it out? Well, it would come from multiplying this x by this x that's been squared and by this x that's been cubed. That's where it's going to come from. So if I were to multiply just the x at the beginning, the x squared that will occur in the middle, and the x cubed that will occur at the end, I'll have x times x squared times x cubed, which is what? x to the sixth. And the number in front is still a 1 because there's a 1 in front of all of those numbers, right? Not that I care about the 1, but I do care about the fact that it's positive. So my leading coefficient is actually x to the sixth on this term. If I were to multiply it all out, it would be x to the sixth. So what's the degree of this polynomial? It's six. That's even. So if the degree is an even number, how are the ends of the graph going to correspond to one another? Yeah, they're either going to both point up or they're both going to point down. And because I have a leading coefficient, what is my leading coefficient here? It's a positive one. In particular, the part that matters is the positive part. It will open up. So these two pieces of information tell me that both sides will point up. So coming back over here to the graph, I know this piece goes up. I know this piece goes up. That's the ends of the graph. Now I've got to use those multiplicities to decide what happens in the middle. So what happens at negative 6? It says multiplicity 2. What's that tell me? It's going to bounce. So it's not going to cut all the way through and go underneath the graph, right? It's going to bounce and come back up. So this graph is going to bounce up, or this x-intercept is going to bounce up. And then I have to hit the y-axis, but I already know where the y-axis I hit. Where do I hit the y-axis? At zero, at the origin. I've already plotted it, so I don't have to actually find that particular point. And what happens at the origin? Do I cross through or do I bounce? I cross through because it's at a multiplicity of one. And then whether you recognize it from the multiplicity or whether you recognize it from the you have no choice at this point, it's going to cross through at seven, right? It's the only way I can connect that to make sense, so it looks something like this. So I've kind of got this wonky-looking W going on. All right, we have one more example in this section. It's slightly different, so let's take a look. This example references another one we already did, and it's got information that makes it an inequality. So inequality means that you're going to have a greater than, a less than, a greater than or equal to, a less than or equal to, right? And we've already talked once about how to solve these. We did it with a test point method. Um, in fact, you guys had a quiz question about it on, on, on Monday. Um, so this method that I'm going to show you now is just an alternate method instead of the test point method where it uses a graph information instead of testing points, okay? So let's take a look. 
It references us back to problem number one that we did last time in class. And in particular, what we want from that problem is the graph. So let's take a look together, and then I'll re-sketch it on this, this page over here. This graph's information, in effect, can answer the question for us without us testing anything. All right? So if you need to, copy it over or just use this piece of information. It's fine. I'm going to copy this graph over to this slide. So we've got our xy axis. It crossed at negative 1, 1, and 1 here. And it looked something like this. Approximately. It should sort of be hitting this axis instead of a little bit sort of floating. But roughly speaking, this is our graph. OK. Now, if you think back to what this equation, um, sort of corresponding equation, would have looked like, this original equation, if you started with it, would have looked like f of x equals all of this stuff, right? This part at the end is something different, but that would have been the function that gave us this graph. Make sense? So if you were doing this particular problem and you didn't have a problem to go back and look at, right, that's how you'd get the graph. You'd start with that piece of information. Well, what does this piece of information at the end tell us? Well, it tells us that we want values that are bigger than zero. What kind of values? Well, f of x values. And f of x is just another fancy name for what? Y. So this piece at the end is actually telling me I want to know where the y values are positive. That's what it's saying. It's saying you can use the graph. And from the graph, you should be able to see where the y values on the graph. And the graph is the white part that I've graphed here, that I've plotted here. The, the axes aren't the graph. They're just a reference point. The graph is the part that I've drawn in white. So on the graph, what part of the white piece here, what part of it is positive? OK. OK, did I have twos or would I have, did I have ones? Did I draw it wrong? Maybe I drew it wrong. Nope, they're ones. OK, so negative two, whoops. Negative two would be over here. OK, so negative 1. That's what I thought you meant. I just want to make sure. So it looks like maybe starting at negative 1 to 1, we've got this hill, right? Do we agree that this sort of hill shape is above the x-axis, which means the y values are positive? We also have this piece over here that's sort of bouncing off the graph and shooting upward, and it's also got y values that are positive. So if we were looking for where it's greater than or equal to 0, we would go from negative 1 all the way to infinity. We don't want greater than or equal to zero. We just want greater than zero. So we can't include this value because that's where it's equal to zero. So we're going to use a union, right? Okay, so we've got the piece here in the middle that looks like the hill. So that piece in the middle is from negative one to one, and we don't include the end points of it. So that's why we're using parentheses, not brackets. And then, like April suggested, we're going to use the union. And we're going to pick back up, still at 1, still using a parenthesis because I still can't equal it. And we're going to continue on into infinity. Okay. If we did the test point method, it would give us the same result. There's nothing special about it. This is just another way of thinking about the problem from a graphical standpoint. Any questions? All right.